I wanted to know if you use privacy wallets like Wasabi Wallet or Join Market. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of them. And even though I know that there are trade offs and some exchanges may not allow you to move your coins after they had been coin joined, and you actually need to move them around for a few times until they no longer get blackmailed. I'm not sure how many times, it depends on the exchange. But I believe that this is very much necessary to make the currency fungible because I think the only characteristic of Bitcoin that the only sound money characteristic that Bitcoin does not have is fungibility. One coin is not really equal to the other because they have different transaction histories. They might have different associations like a Bitcoin from 2010 is most likely or has most likely been on the Silk Road at some point. And you can either not like that and not accept the coin or move on and say, you know, it's money, it should be fungible. And we need tools that make it fungible. And I might be biased here because my podcast is sponsored by Wasabi Wallet, but I have been a user of Wasabi since 2019, since one of the earliest versions of it. And I very much enjoyed the way that it provides privacy, not just in terms of coin joins, but also at the network level. And in terms of downloading blocks, even if you're not running a node, it downloads blocks instead of relying on somebody else's node to get validation. So it's like running a pruned node locally. It downloads the blocks that you need to manage your own transactions. And it also has some nice features in terms of not allowing somebody to lurk over your shoulder to see how much money you have. It's called lurker wipe mode. And what else does it do? It prevents address reuse. So when you use an address, you no longer have it on the clipboard in the menu. So you can only reuse addresses on purpose if you actually try to do it, but you're not going to have them on your list after you had used them at least once. So these are all very small things that you get when you use Wasabi, but they truly matter and they really help because network level and not reusing receiving addresses are actually very important for your own privacy and for understanding how Bitcoin is supposed to work. When I first got into Bitcoin, I think the wallets at the time, most the most popular of them at least, did not even allow you to generate multiple addresses. You only had one address that you were using for all of the transactions. And I think that's what Ethereum has because Ethereum has no UTXOs. And I like to regard it as some sort of Orwellian nightmare because you can see on anyone's domain what they are up to, what they receive, what they send. I don't think that's the point of this. The transparency only exists for the purpose of auditing the supply to make it clear that there is no inflation. But I don't think that this should be the end game to see everyone else's transaction. And if there is any proposal for more Bitcoin privacy, I'm pretty sure that I will be in favor as long as it doesn't break consensus and it's going to be a soft fork. But if we have a forced hard fork because something breaks and they also add something for privacy, I'm going to be a fan of that. What are your thoughts on the Bitcoin mining, mining council? Um, do you see, I, I'm aware that they are trying to, you know, spread, they're trying to dispel all forms of FUD regarding Bitcoin mining and how it boils the ocean and all that, you know, stuff, all that, you know, nonsense. But what are your thoughts? Do you think that we should have such a centralized entity that in, in a certain fashion would act like the face of Bitcoin regards, you know, you know, Bitcoin mining, or do you think that, you know, it, it, there could be a future threat in the sense of the, uh, if you remember the New York agreement and the whole segwit, you know, you know, scuffle and, and in that fashion, do you think it, it could be something, it becomes something more of a threat in the future or it's, it's, it's nothing we should worry about? Yeah, so I'm not a fan. I could never endorse the project like that. And it's basically just a bunch of rich people who bought a lot of Bitcoin and decided that they should create some sort of authority for themselves and put themselves in a situation where they are spokespeople of Bitcoin mining in North America. And I don't think that's fair. There are people mining from home and they should not be represented by these people. 
And I don't know, it's kind of the situation where you can't really do anything about it. You can disagree, you can try to troll them. And that has been the case with lots of attempts. I think there was at some point Nakamoto.com, a quote unquote pro Bitcoin website where all of the big blockers were writing articles trying to explain to you what Bitcoin is. And I think that one got shut down after the community became outraged by the fact that these people are trying to educate others on what Bitcoin should be. But there is nothing really that we can do about it except for helping others and trying to support the networks with our own means. So if you can mine from home or you can organize something so that you and your friends buy a miner or something and you split the rewards. And I, I don't know, there are so many approaches and scenarios to this, but if you can help the network by providing security by yourself, you should try to do it. And I hope that it's gonna be profitable at some point, but these people who try to establish organizations, they're not really helping the environment. That's only the excuse that they're using. They are only trying to put themselves at the top and basically destroy, burn the bridge so that nobody else can get to their level in the future. And this has been the case in big tech. You can see how companies like Facebook and even Twitter, they try to monopolize by copying the features that other platforms have. Like Twitter, I'm not sure if you observed, but they encapsulated the use case of Clubhouse and that only took like a couple of months. And now nobody really uses Clubhouse anymore. They're on Twitter. And Instagram and Facebook have done the same with stories. They stole them from Snapchat and they established themselves as a stronger monopoly. And they might even file patents and prevent other small companies to get there and never make it. And if there's anything innovative, they're, they're going to purchase it or try to influence it or take it out of the business. That's only part of the game. And most of the times it's rigged and it's not even part of the free market because they involve the government and they try to get to pass laws that are favor favorable to them. And I think the mining council is trying to do something similar. I hope that this kind of approach is not going to be replicated in Europe, in Asia, or in any other organizations of states because it's really terrible. And I hope that the game theory is going to discourage this and miners are going to migrate outside of these arrangements and they're going to go bankrupt or they're not going to succeed in the ways that they wish they would and capitulate, hopefully. But I don't know, it's not up to me to decide what they do with their time and with their Bitcoin, but we can only hope that we're going to support the network enough to make it stronger and make it more decentralized because we like to brag about decentralization a lot and say that this is a decentralized project, but really how many of us actually help it become decentralized? Yeah, it's been great to have, have you on and great to talk to you. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure the, uh, the listeners appreciate it as well. Um, and obviously for anyone out there listening, thank you for listening as well. Um, but yeah, um, it, are there any sort of final things you wanted to, to say, I guess? Like, uh, is there anything you're working on at the moment that you wanted to just quickly talk about? Well, I'm working on season nine of the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. And right now I've recorded episodes up to seven, I think. So next week I'm going to release two of them. So stay tuned for that. It's available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and also Sphinx. If you're into that, it's kind of exciting that you can listen on the Lightning Network. And if you want to pay for the minute, you can actually do that. I'm not saying that you should do it. You can listen to it for free somewhere else, but it, you can still do that for whatever reason. And I also have an RSS feed where you can listen to the episodes for free and without any kind of interference. And you can even open them in Tor or download them locally. My sponsors are very big fans of privacy, so they don't care that I'm not going to have good statistics because of people trying to get more privacy listening to the episodes. But I think that the information can be useful to people living in regimes that are authoritarian and not necessarily able to access some Bitcoin resources. So if I can extend the range of the service to say so, 
I will happily do it at the expense of having good statistics on Apple Podcasts or something, which I kind of hate. I hope that more people listen in a decentralized and permissionless and free way, which doesn't track them and grants them all the privacy and all the sovereignty that they need. And yeah, I also have a website where I write articles and I'm going to publish a magazine that's going to get printed and I'm going to give it away for free at conferences. So that's where I'm at right now. So a lot going on, essentially, which I like. Uh, okay, well, yeah, Bitcoin, Bitcoin takeover. And uh, yeah, I say everyone go check it out um, and see, see what it's up to. And yeah, thanks, Vlad. Uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, take care, everyone. Uh, have an amazing weekend or week whenever you're listening. Um, and remember to buy Bitcoin.